My name is Philip Krim, and I am pumped to mic it up. Welcome to Mike It Up with GoodBed.com's Jeff Cassidy. So when that's the case, it becomes harder just psychologically to make a change. And Mike Magnuson. If you're doing those things, you can be competitive long term. Just when you thought these number crunching data lovers couldn't get any nerdier, they started a podcast. And I know this is pretty controversial, but this is why we're having a podcast, right? But if you want to be smart about how the mattress shopping journey is changing and what retailers and manufacturers should be doing about it, well then, man, have you ever found your people? Because right now, it's time to mic it up. That was a great, that was a good one. <laughs> all right, good. So, uh, awesome. Well, first of all, how are you, man? It's been, a, it's been a while. I mean, I was in your office like in what, February? Yeah, right before the pandemic. Uh, yeah, yeah, I remember that. You were visiting New York and we caught up and then you know, two months later, the world shut down and the office is closed and our stores are closed. And, uh, you know, it was a, a pretty wild 2020. Uh, still still a wild time. So, uh, but I, I'm well, thank no you doubt. for asking. Yeah, and that and that feels to me. I don't know if the, if, you, if this resonates with you, but that feels to me like so much longer than a year and three months ago or whatever. I mean, that feels easily like three years ago. It, it feels like forever ago, and I, I don't know if that's COVID <laughs> time or just uh, I don't know. The world works differently now, but yeah, it does feel like forever ago. Forever and yet yeah. still one long day ago. Right. right. <laughs> At, At the, the same, same time. time. Yeah. One long Zoom ago. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, exactly. It's been uh it's been quite a journey. And actually I wanted to ask you what it was like for you. I mean, you guys went public in February, right? Like early February. February. And then the I mean, and you're, by the way, you go, when you go public, for those of you listening who don't know this, you know, you're required to put out a prospectus and it's required to contain what are called like risk statements or risk factors, which, which go on for like dozens of pages for any company. And, and then here you are six weeks or less into being a public company and this massive thing, this massive disruption to your business happens, which probably was amazingly not even among the like dozens and dozens of risk factors you listed because how could it be and what was that like <laughs> I, you know it was it was crazy it was scary it was terrifying it was uh unknown territory uh you know and there's a global pandemic that no one knows how that's going to shape out, you know, everyone's worried about their own health, their family's health. Uh, at the same time, you know, running a company and having a lot of employees who are looking to you to make decisions that can impact people's health. Um, you know, it was a, a really daunting, challenging time as, as, you know, just personally as a father, as, as the CEO of the company, I mean, it, it was scary. And, you know, it, it's one where, I just remember like talking to the team about it. Like we just got to take things one day at a time. And yeah, we were a public company, but I, I don't think that would have changed just how, how frightening that time was for everyone. I mean, you know, the, the news was horrifying. No one knew exactly what this pandemic meant, how you caught the virus, uh, what the virus did to you. Um, some of the treatments were making people worse. Uh, and so, it was just and of course you guys were in the middle of it being in New York. I mean, that was really that, kind of at least in the u.s that was the epicenter yeah it, it was really like I, the second epicenter i mean seattle kind of first and then and then straight to new york and and again you know shutting down the office was a huge decision we'd never worked remotely um you know allowing people to work from home understanding what would that look like would we be productive would things fall apart how would we work we'd been hiring so you know what, what are we going to do with new employees who don't you know know their peers um and so we, we just had to immediately kind of figure out a bunch of things like how, how does it work to have the company fully remote, um, you know, li live life on Zoom, live life in Slack, uh, you know, operate totally differently uh, with a team that was used to coming together and, and you know, talking about these challenges and, and navigating them and the added pressure of, you know, being public. And so what we did, you know, we, we had to think about how to announce and I've never run a public company. So there were a lot of new rules and regulations to think about and how, how to to just navigate everything it was it was a tumultuous time that 
Um, you know, lo looking back, I, I think that the company came together. I think people are very um, uh, resilient. And I, I think the company was resilient. And I think people just powered through a time that, that was scary. And I think the unfortunate thing, like lesson with 2020 is it's not like it was one thing and then we got past it. it you know, it kept being these big issues that would hit us and, and things that, that we didn't think about, whether it was, you know, civil rights issues with George Floyd. I mean, that was a year ago. Uh, and thinking about um, just how to bring together a diverse workforce, you know, within Casper. And again, just what that means for us personally and how that's impacting different people and, and families and, um, you know, what that means for work, but also what that means for people at home and how to make sure people are you know, creating balance in their life when they are sitting on Zooms all the time and, you know, just reflecting on a bunch of different considerations throughout the year. And, uh, you know, 2020 wasn't a fun one. I, I you know, don't want to relive that one. Just I think, right. I mean, tumultuous, to say the least. This, this is not something we normally get into in our podcast, but I just find it interesting. So as you like you said, you have never been the CEO of a public company before. Huge change in your career, huge step in your career. And then this crazy time happens that can be a very being the leader can be a very lonely position in any circumstance, but especially in something like that. Do you have any kind of network of mentors or did you have people you felt you could go to? Like, how did you yourself at a very personal level navigate through that that challenge? Yeah, you know, um, fortunately, we we have a great board and uh, they, they were kind of a good steady hand of folks who had been through, you know, similar, not obviously the same, but been through very tumultuous times. Uh, I, you know, I have a couple of, of uh, investors who were are partners of the business who have known us for a long time. And, and they were, I think, very good, sound, you know, advice and, and people with, you know, lots of experience to lean on. Um, I have co-founders in the business, uh, so, you know, worked with my co-founders on, on how to navigate it. Um, and so th there were a lot of people around the table who wanted to make sure we, you know, did the right things, made the right decisions, were being very thoughtful about decisions that would impact the business and impact our employees and impact our customers. Um, uh, you know, I work with an executive coach who, like, what he does all the time is just work with CEOs and founders on you know, really tricky situations and, and making sure that we're thinking about things, uh, you know, as holistically as we can and trying not to be too emotional in a time that's full of emotionality and trying to, to make sure that we're not rushing to decisions in a world where you don't see a clear picture. Um, and so just trying to kind of stay level headed and, and you know, be uh, a good anchor for everyone else who, you know, it, it's natural to spin in these situations. It's natural to to look for, for guidance and, and points of, uh, you, you know, clarity. And so certainly had, you know, people that I relied on for that and then tried to be uh, a good, um, you know, point of light or North Star for people that were looking to me to help them navigate it uh, and the company navigate it. Well, congrats on weathering all yeah. of that. And, and on top of that, in terms of maintaining continued growth, in that time and uh especially as you put it under the with the added pressure of being a brand new public company so what a wild ride and <laughs> i don't envy that you had to go through that but but congrats on coming out the other side and and sort of surviving and thriving no uh, I, I appreciate that and, and it's certainly not to say that a lot of people had it far worse than, than us and and far worse than me and so um you know it's always good to keep the that perspective that uh, you know there we, we, we at the end of it when you look back like we, we did pretty well through the year and, and the company navigated the challenges and and we did what we had to do to deliver for our customers and deliver for our retail partners and you know overall came through the the you know 2020 as a year you know pretty well and, and pretty strong and, and are really excited about kind of what the future holds for us so we, we definitely count ourselves lucky in that regard. Um, and, and are happy we were able to, to weather things the way we did. I actually think we're now set up in a lot of regards to be stronger because of it. Good stuff. Good to hear. All right. Well, let's shift gears. I want to do this little lightning round that we usually do in the beginning, just to kind of uh, just stupid little fun thing that we like to do. All right. Here we go. So it's just going to be really 
quick questions, quick answers. Have fun with it. We're coming into summer. Favorite summer activity? Well, I have a uh, little over two-year-old who loves the pool, and so I'm very excited for the weather to be warm enough to play in the pool with him. <laughs> That's great. Awesome. You're in New York City. It's Hipster Central. How do you feel about handlebar mustaches? <laughs> I, I'm not in uh, you know hipster epicenter of you know East Village or, or Brooklyn, so probably not the biggest fan out there. And, and I really can't grow facial hair, so definitely not something that will ever be in, in my future. <laughs> <laughs> All right. That was my next question. You took that one right out of my mouth. Uh, <laughs> uh, in what non-sport activity, we're coming into the Olympic season here, in what non-sport activity, though, would you be most likely to win an Olympic medal? I, I feel like eating or drinking might be the right answer. <laughs> <laughs> it's especially a competitive through, field. Watch out. Yeah, especially through COVID. I've been yeah, able exactly. to hone in my That's... skills very well. <laughs> uh, all right. Scale of 1 to 10, how good of a sleeper are you? Uh, this is a point of pride, so I, I think I'm a, a nine plus. Nice, nice. Who should play you in the movie about your life? Uh, is Brad Pitt or George Clooney available? I don't know. <laughs> I'm assuming. Yeah. I'm assuming they're going to be both lined up and vying for it. <laughs> All right. What's your favorite holiday? Favorite holiday. I mean, I guess going back to the the eating strength, uh, Thanksgiving's got to be up there. Nice. Good choice. What was your favorite toy as a kid? Favorite toy? Uh, I was, I, I like to build stuff. So like Legos when I was little. And then um, I, what, I don't remember what they were called, like the erector sets. The, mm -hmm. you know. Yeah, I think they yeah. were called erector sets. Yeah. Yeah. I, I identify with both of those answers. Uh, best music decade of the past 100 years. Best music decade. That's a good one. I would say, I mean, I listen to a lot of like 90s, 2000s, because that's what I grew up with, I guess. But, you know, 70s is becoming more and more uh, probably popular in our household. So, I don't know. I would say we're nice. a, a generalist household for sure. I thought you were going to say more popular with the handlebar Gnostic. mustache crowd. But. <laughs> <laughs> What's the last thing you asked Siri? The last thing I asked Siri uh, to play Wheels on the Bus for my son's. <laughs> <laughs> nice. That's a good one. If you had a walk-up song like a major league baseball player, what would it be? Oh, that's a good one. Um, uh, I, I feel like because all I do is talk to investors and raise money, like uh, you know that song "I Need a Dollar." Um, I feel like that's <laughs> nice. That's a good one. <laughs> Absolutely. All right. And last question: What's something that made you smile recently? Uh, I, I have a four week old daughter at home. So seeing a, a really oh. fresh baby is always something that makes me smile. <laughs> congratulations. Hey, congratulations. I did not know about that. Thank you. That's awesome. So, wow. You got the million dollar family now. One of each, right? <laughs> Boy sure. and girl. Boy and girl. Yep. Excellent. Excellent. All right, cool. Well, uh, thanks for hanging with us through that, uh, the little lightning round, uh, goofiness all right well we wanted to let's start off talking a little bit i know casper has a, a host of new products on the particular on the mattress side right now um i'd love to just ha have you tell us a little bit about those new products and really kind of what's the bigger picture product strategy that they fit into yeah thank you for asking about that so we just launched our cooling collection and uh relative to the mattress lineup that means we introduced uh what we're calling snow technology and snow technology is available on our two higher end lines, which is the Nova and the Wave. And it's advanced cooling features that allow the mattress to sleep cooler than um, you know, previous models we've had. And the way we're able to do that is through cooling technology that actually pulls heat uh, from the, the top of the bed down deeper into the bed so it keeps a cooler sleep surface, but it actually can do that for 12 plus hours. And so the innovation that we had was the ability to build additional capacity to pull that heat. So when we looked at other products that had cooling features, they were cool to the touch and they would cool for you know a few minutes at a time, but the problem was that capacity wasn't there and so they would uh, run out of capacity and, and heat up um, before you would even fall asleep. And so the real innovation, which we, we called heat delete bands that sit lower into the bed, are the ability to absorb heat for 12 plus hours. And so these mattresses stay cooler than anything we've tested um, for the entire night of sleep. And, and temperature is one of the 
biggest variables that influence people's sleep and is number one on consumers' minds when they're shopping for a new mattress. So we're really excited about it. They have a, a great experiential aspect that, you know, the cover is cooler to the touch when you touch it. But it, it, I think, more importantly, has real efficacy gains around sleep quality because it will keep your sleep environment cooler for longer. Um, and then we did launch some other products as part of the cooling collection, including our Hyperlite sheets, which are sheets that are also designed to keep you cooler and circulate air more. Um, and so we're really focused on continuing to elevate and improve uh, the quality of people's sleep by, by bringing in new technology and new features. Got it. So this is uh, just in time for summer, kind of leaning into cooling as a really key part of the story. That's here. right. Exactly. And, and making it available across the same fields that you've had success with in, in your existing models and some of the higher end ones. That's right. Yep. It's, so it's existing models and just kind of an upgraded um, feature that uh, you can add to, to the Nova. And what but interestingly, it wasn't just that it was a, a different cover. It sounded like there was there's there's things like deep into the guts of the mattress that are actually changed out that that pr help provide this cooling too. That is that that's right? That's right. There are internal components specifically to the snow technology that allow it to to stay cool. And so it, got it. So you're able to use the offer the same feel while still changing the guts uh, to offer the that's cooling. Right. Yep, exactly. So it, the wave, for example, has the same ergonomic benefits of the gel pods. They give you dynamic uh, support throughout the night. They have the same benefits of the airscape layers. Uh, the difference is if you add in the snow technology, we'll add in the cooling technology throughout the bed. Got it. it sounds like Got that it. this is something, the cooling aspect and the, 12, the longer duration cooling is something you've been able to prove scientifically. Do you see challenge with some of the marketing of other uh, companies and other products that maybe make similar claims but don't have any science to back it up? Well, what we... And, and actually, I have one follow-up to that question just before you... Is it... Do you feel that you have a higher level of, like, standard now that you're a public company in terms of, like, what claims you make? Do you have to... Is, is there, do you have a legal department now that's down your neck about you know, proof of these things more so than you would have had as a private company? Um, so, so one, um, I guess, regardless of private or public, we've already always had a pretty high standards that we would hold ourselves to. Um, and, and so the legal standards don't change whether you're private or public. And so, you know, our, our views on what we would do haven't changed. Uh, we, we do think there are, folks in the marketplace that are misleading with some of their marketing. And, and really our goal, I think, is to educate consumers about this, which is why I talk about, you know, it's not just that it's cool to the touch. There are others out there who have that, that offer for consumers. Um, but the important thing is mm -hmm. to think about how does that influence sleep? Uh, and for it to influence sleep, it has to stay cool. And so that's why the capacity is something that's really important. And so it's one thing to talk about, you know, it's this much cooler when you just get in bed, and that's fine, but that's not what's going to ultimately drive you to get the best night of sleep possible. And so it's tying our marketing claims into actual research that we've done. And we have uh, Casper Labs is a part of our office setup where we have a sleep lab. And so we test this and we have sensors and we have data around all of the testing that we've done. And we've compared, you know, to, to identical beds that, that have the technology and not and can quantify the benefits. And so we, we have to substantiate the claims we make, of course, before we make them. And then we have to educate people that, you know, all claims aren't created equal. What, what should be important to you? And it's how does it feel throughout the night? And that's what really will drive a higher sleep quality. And so Casper's always taken the view of let, let's make claims that obviously are true and, and substantiated, but let's do so in a world where there's a lot to debunk in the mattress industry. And so how can we be the source of truth and a, a trusted destination for people who want to learn about uh, what makes the best night of sleep possible? No doubt. Um, staying on this subject of innovation, you mentioned the Casper Labs. You guys have always placed an emphasis on innovation and, and on products coming out of your labs. I'm just curious, looking around the category, like what else in the mattress marketplace impresses you as innovative, whether on the product side or even just on some of the like distribution, retail marketing operations? Like what do you see out there that impresses you as innovative? You know, I, I think one of the areas of kind of the sleep ecosystem that Casper doesn't play in, but I think 
is really helping people sleep better are some of these apps out there. I mean, I, I talk to a lot of people and, and know a lot of people who use apps to fall asleep every day. And I think that's really interesting. Obviously, that wasn't the case five, 10 years ago. And so I've been spending a lot of time thinking about, you know, digital solutions to a better night of sleep and, and how people can change their bedtime routine to include a digital app in the right way that, that really does help improve your quality of sleep. And I also think what people are doing around sleep tracking uh, as a way to drive behavior change is really interesting. So the Aura Ring and the Whoop Band are enforcing are reinforcing people's mindset around sleep and prioritizing your day to get a better night of sleep, reducing caffeine, mm -hmm. having consistent bedtimes, et cetera. So I think that's super interesting too. And th these are big consumer trends with, you know, lots and lots of people um, influenced by them. And, and Apple Watch is another example of, of just putting sleep front and center and helping people measure their sleep and change their lives to improve their sleep. I think that's all really great for uh, helping the world sleep better, which is kind of core to Casper's mission. In the first uh, case, when you were talking about apps that people are using to fall asleep, is that would that be like Calm and things like that? Yeah, I, I think those are you know Calm and Headspace are two examples of meditation apps who actually are used to sleep for most people. I think I think more people use those to sleep than to meditate, and I think that's awesome. Uh, there, there's a mm -hmm. bunch out there, and and some with some really interesting takes on it. I'm curious, what's your take on the state of sleep, the, the state of the usefulness of sleep tracking? Because we've had sleep tracking for a long time now, but I don't think it ever really has reached a state of real actionable usefulness. What's your take on where we are in that kind of evolution of, of sleep tracking? No, I, I think you're exactly right, which um, that's why I say it, it's sleep tracking that really just elevates it to be more of a, a top of mind concern so that you change your behavior, which is not that, you know, the, the ring is going to reduce your caffeine input. Um, but if you're wearing an aura ring and you are looking at your sleep data, then you will be more mindful about drinking caffeine or drinking wine before bed or something like that. Um, so I think it's good from a behavior change standpoint, but I, I think you're right. The problem with a lot of the sleep tracking technologies are that they have high churn. People just don't use them for a long time. And so a lot of the behavior change is short lived. And, and I think the next chapter will be how do we use sleep tracking data to, to, uh, change your sleep environment to get you a better night of sleep without you having to do something. Because when you have to do something, that's where I think the churn becomes an issue and, and people just stop doing it. But I think there are ways that you can yeah. incorporate sleep data to actively change your environment for, for the better. And I think that will be the next chapter for uh, kind of the, the way sleep tracking can impact people's sleep. And is that an area where you expect Casper to want to be playing? Um, I, th I think we've we, we continue to pay attention to the entire sleep ecosystem and, and we have products that influence different variables. So, you know, we talked about temperature, uh, the Casper glow light is a great example of how we can influence the lighting when you're falling asleep and, and when you're waking up. Um, and, and I think when mm -hmm. we think about, you know, five, 10 years from now, wh what do people's bedrooms look like? We think it will be uh, ones that are using sensors, tracking your sleep, influencing the sleep environment, so that all of your senses are optimized to help you fall asleep faster, stay asleep longer, and wake up more gently. What? Let's go. Let's shift back to uh, mattresses. I mean, w and talk about sort of what the future holds. I know you can't release information about products that haven't been released or whatever, but but just big picture. Um, I mean, how much more product line expansion? Uh, potential or opportunity do you see within mattresses for Casper? Is this something where like it's unlimited, sky's the limit kind of lots of models out there? Or is it like you just see a couple gaps here and there that maybe you want to fill? I mean, what what do you see for the future there? So, um, within our mattress business, I still see a long way to, to go to kind of expand our lineup over time. Um, and, and part of that is talking to our retail partners and understanding what do they want to see from us and, and where do they think we should play. And that, that was part of what went into the snow technology development. Um, we had retail partners who said, we think you can sell a, a higher priced product. We think that if you add in more differentiated technology, it will sell, sell really well. And so far we launched the snow technology in our DTC channel. So it's in our stores and on our website, casper.com. We're quickly going to take it into our retail partnership channel, and 
um, we, we've had great reception of people who want to carry that and will give us additional slots to do so because we use their feedback to, to drive that development. And we, we have lots of other feedback. So there, there are definitely room, there, there are definitely a number of ways and lots of room for us to expand our mattress lineup. But I, I think we're also very excited to expand our non-mattress lineup. And, uh, you know, there are lots of products that can help people sleep better um, that I think Casper should have in the market. And some of these are categories that we're in but can expand in. So pillows are a great example where for a long time we had a single pillow that we designed with a pillow and pillow construction that used a synthetic fiber material. But upon doing more mm -hmm. consumer research, we, we discovered, you know, some people love their foam pillows and some people love their down pillows. And so now we have more options for consumers within um, our pillow category and, and the pillow business has been growing really fast. So um, I think there are lots of opportunities to expand other categories, to move into other categories, and then to fill out what we're doing in the categories where we currently compete. Do you see, you mentioned the snow uh, products are currently on your website, but not in the retail channels, but they're going to be in the retail channels. Do you see overall, big picture, store products and your D2C products evolving separately or together? Um, I, I think it's a mixed bag. Um, I think there are some products that we design and develop with DTC in mind. And then there are some products that we design and develop where it's only retail partners. And there are some products where we think about it in an omni-channel approach. So we, we try to do that work up front in, in kind of the design phase of thinking about what's the right distribution, what's the right price point, how do we think about margins, what's the right level of innovation. And that all goes into kind of the framework on how we design and engineer the products that we create. Mm -hmm. Is there, I mean, how are you thinking about in that same respect, even channel conflict, particularly when it, I mean, I know you're in like Costco. I mean, how do you think about that type of thing? I mean, do, are you, is that more about like having differentiated products by channel or what's the strategy? Long term, you think there? Yeah, I mean, we think a lot about it, and we work with our partners uh, very closely to think about it. Um, meaning, you know, some products everyone's benefited by having an omni-channel presence. And so, when Casper promotes the the wave with snow technology on the website, it's going to drive more interest at our retail partners. And so, we like the idea of having that yeah. everywhere. Um, but some partners want to have exclusive products to talk about. We're happy to figure out a way to design and develop those as well. Got it. Um, so in terms of the retail distribution, now you've been now, I think it's what, like a year or so that you started going into retail showrooms. Is that about right? Uh, with, maybe even less with trial opportunities. Yeah. Uh, about some, a little more than a year and then COVID put some things on hold and then some for less than a year now. Um, but the, the trial opportunities okay. where you can lay on the product. Um, I think we started that really, I want to say like Q4-ish of 19. I, I could be wrong on that, but um, something like that. Okay. And then where you can actually buy it from the store, that started later? Well, like uh, that... you know, Costco started before that. So you could buy it at a Costco and take it home with you, but you couldn't lay on the product. Oh, I Okay. And yes, then, when I was saying showrooms, I was talking about the ones where you can actually try it. Yeah, okay, and then, then um, our own and operated showrooms where we, we have our own stores, uh, that started before that. So we, we've been rolling those out of since, course. Uh, I think, 2018. We have 72 of those today. And then we have um, more than 20 retail partnerships, which are retailers that we work with, like a Costco or a Raymore and Flanagan or a Rooms to Go. And of the ones that are what we'll call showrooms where you can actually try the product, is there a, like do you have a sense of or if you've provided any public information on how many doors that that represents at this point or like how big that network is? The trial like opportunities where you can lay on the product, we, we've talked about it's in the hundreds, not thousands. So it's in, relatively in, small in the hundreds, compared okay. to others. And is there a target number in mind in a certain time frame that you have for that particular channel? No, we... we um, we, we haven't talked about specific targets and, and we also don't believe that like all doors are created equal. So right now we're really focused on building the business we have with the partners that are, you know, lined up and, and selling Casper products. We will opportunistically launch new product, uh, new partnerships as the supply chain will, you know, allow it. But, you know, we, we've been in a really tight supply chain environment. And so we just want to make sure that as we do stand up, 
new partners were able to deliver on the product that we, we promised them. And, and that hasn't been going on in the industry lately. And we've done a good job of doing it, which is why our retail partnership business has grown so notably, um, you know, north of 50% in each of the last two quarters. And, and we want to continue to make sure we can flow inventory to the retail partners that we work with. That makes yeah. sense. And I think bef prior you had talked about um, previously, not today, but in, in general, about 200 as a target for owned and operated stores. Is that still the idea, separate from the supply chain challenges of the moment? So um, we've talked about long term how I believe that Casper can support north of 200 stores. And, and I, I think that's still true. Um, the pace on, on opening doors are what's changed with COVID. And so we continue to look at store performance and we'll monitor it and how the retail world reopens and how our stores perform uh, will drive overall the pace of, of opening up new doors. We're, we're not opening up a lot of doors right now. We have 72 doors today. Um, and and uh, overall though, I, I still think retail is gonna be really important to our brand, to our business, to the industry at large. And we're really excited by the experience that our stores offer to consumers. And we think it's a great complement to the retail partnerships uh, that we have who offer you know, a, a selection of our products as well. And uh, we see a great you know, opportunity when we look at DMAs and markets where we have our own store, our dot-com business, obviously, and a retail partnership with the right locations. Talk about that a little bit more, if you would, the, the, how it's complementary, because you guys have been ha operating your own stores. I mean, even before you mentioned 2018, you were doing the pop-ups. I'm sure you were learning a lot from those. And now since then, from these more permanent stores, I'm sure you've learned a ton that maybe you couldn't necessarily learn through a third-party retailer intermediary. But I would imagine that a lot of those lessons you can now impart and translate to your retail partners to their benefit. Like... Can you give any examples of sort of success stories on that front or just being able to share learnings with your retail partners? Yeah, we, we um, so our stores have really high foot traffic. We put them in very visible locations, oftentimes next to a Lululemon, to an Apple store. And, and part of that is because it helps elevate the brand. It helps build brand awareness. And it's a source of, of education for consumers. And a lot of times we hear anecdotally consumers who went into a Casper store to learn more about the options and then ultimately bought at their local Raymore Flanagan or bought at their local Denver mattress. And so d distribution can be about education and awareness, and it can also be about convenience. And so that's where we think these are, are channels that work together to be accretive for um, the overall business at Casper, but, but good for the partner and good for us. And, and that's why we do call them retail partners. Uh, we know that it's not mm -hmm. going to work out well for Casper if it doesn't work out well for them. So we invest to make sure that um, we're doing the, the best ability we have to help them build their business. Um, and to your point, th these are learnings that can be applied across the different channels. So as we learn how customers want to shop for the snow technology, for example, we're then able to educate our field sales team and the field sales team can educate the retail store associates of our retail partners so that they have the, the latest lessons learned on how to sell products, how to position them, uh, and all the things that it takes to drive a, a great you know, retail business today. Flipping that around, I mean, you guys are obviously in a, a, a great position as it relates to, I'm sure there are far more retailers who'd love to carry Casper products than you have certainly the capacity at this point to, to, to open. What... Uh, as you look opportunistically, as you put it, what do you look for in a retail partner? What's what, especially looking at what's worked well with the ones you have so far, like what, what has that taught you about what's, what's a great partner for Casper on the retail side? Yeah. You know, I, I think, I think the issue the industry has had for far too long is that manufacturers and retailers looked at each other as adversaries fighting for every dollar and looked at the customer as just a transaction to exploit. And the retailers that we work with don't, uh, don't look at us as an adversary and look at it as a partnership and how we grow our business together and don't look at the customer as a transaction, look at the customer as a way to build a, a lifetime relationship and lifetime value with. And so if philosophically we're aligned in, in developing a, a great customer experience and promoting Casper's brand in the right way and, and getting customers who have great experiences end to end in shopping for a product, 
then great. I, I think we'll find a great way to do business together where we both can make money. Um, if we don't, and if we, we see someone approach it where they're going to try to exploit Casper for every penny and the customer for every penny, then there's probably not a great path to, to work together. Yeah, I like that answer. I mean, that's uh, so some of the some of the trends that you guys, I mean, you guys highlighted when you started the business as it relates to, you know, some of the tr problems with brick and mortar. You're looking for partners who really are the opposite or uh, are, are also fighting against those same trends in a sense. That makes sense. Um, let's talk about advertising and customer acquisition. I mean, that's obviously such a, um, a, a, a constant thing in this industry. In fact, let's start, I want to start something, uh, with something interesting, in, uh, in this regard, we are, this is an industry that's always in customer acquisition mode because it's an industry that has struggled a lot with customer loyalty as it relates particularly to the product, product loyalty. I know you have talked about return purchases publicly. I've, I feel like I've seen statistics you've provided uh, about return purchasers. And I, I, and I certainly know that you've been forward thinking about this issue of how to maintain relationships with customers between purchases and, and try to hopefully build that loyalty like the Van Winkle uh, kind of experiment, if you will, comes to mind on that front. So this is, seems to me, because of the fact that customer acquisition is such a big part of the value chain in this industry, retention and loyalty feels like kind of one of those holy grails of this industry. I'm just curious, as someone who's been out there thinking about this and experimenting with things on this front, what have you learned on, on this front? Have you, have you been able to learn anything that you think can really influence return purchase intent when that time comes? Yeah, it's a great question. And I think at the core of the question is, is really just the importance of brand. Um, I think we, we talked about this at the time of the IPO was that, um, uh, and, and feel free to, we'll have to double check this, but I think it was that north of 20% of uh, our, our business was coming from repeat customers. And uh, that's obviously speaking to that there's significant lifetime value with our customers. And it's because customers remember the brand. They remember Casper. They had a good experience with Casper. They liked the products. And, and we've always put the brand front and center of the business. And we've put the brand as, as a moat around our business. Um, and, and brands matter in this industry. You know, there's a reason why Sealy, Serta, and Simmons are so sticky and, and why they still have the majority of market share. It's because brands matter. They uh, allow mm -hmm. the, the, that product to be immediately in the consideration set for consumers. And if, if you're a brand that resonates, if you're a brand that's differentiated, if you're a brand that has real value, consumers will come back to you. And we're seeing that day in and day out with our business. And, and that's a core part of the value we're building over time. And it's one of the things that I think our retail partners can benefit from. If you, know, if you discover, if you learn, if you buy Casper from one of our retail partners, um, my guess would be that, that they're going to have a great experience and they're going to come back to shop um, often because they'll remember that. And, and that was something that we learned in some of the customer insight work we did when we started the business and that we continue to. You ask most people what brand of mattress they sleep on, most people can't recall it. Uh, you ask most Casper customers what brand of, of bed they sleep on, they recall it. And so it's... Yeah, it's, that's good call not making your brand start with an yeah, S. Yes, that's cool. <laughs> <laughs> um, no, and it, it, it's a good point. It's, you know, it, it, was, it was a sea of sameness before Casper came along. It was... Uh, a sea of off-white rectangular pieces of foam on a floor uh, that all sounded the same. And that's what one of the reasons that was so intimidating for consumers to shop for mattresses before Casper. And we really tried to rethink everything from how the bed looks, how it's constructed, how you shop for it, how you get information, how to make it more of a transparent process. And that's still how we think about you know, designing, developing uh, our products and, and core to our brand value. Where does the just the product diversification and serving these other products besides mattresses fit into this same question of maintaining a customer, maintaining a relationship with the customer, remaining top of mind with that customer for when the next uh, sort of replacement 
mattress replacement cycle comes around. Like, how how does the broader pro- product portfolio strategy fit in with that? And, and just an additional layer to that: how does that also fit in when it's uh, a, re- a customer who purchases through a retail partner? Yeah, gr- great questions, and I think kind of the same answer, um, regardless of where you buy from us, is that. We, we, we talked to our customers and we launched the business. We said, okay, we're going to design this one perfect mattress for everyone, one price point, one model, et cetera. And a lot of people bought that. But then a lot of people said, oh, do you have maybe a lower price point for my kid's room or the guest room? Um, or do you have a model that has advanced ergonomic features because I have a bad back and, and I wake up sore every day? Or, you know, I sleep really hot. Do you have a model that has more cooling features? And so... We, you know, we, we heard different feedback. We heard some people say they love foam mattresses, and we heard some people say they love the, the traditional feel of an inner spring mattress. And so it's collecting all of this feedback, listening to our customers that led us to develop the hybrid line, um, which we have uh, now at the high end of our lineup. It's what led us to develop the Nova, which is our, our plushest bed, because some people like that, that really plush soft feel. And it's what led us to design the Wave, which you know, I, I've had a bad back since high school, and so I, I was very uh, acute to, to solving people with back pain, and, and we really studied how do we have the most advanced ergonomics. And so it, it came back to asking ourselves, what do we want to build? And we, we want to build a democratized brand that has the right sleep solution regardless of your budget, regardless of what you're shopping for. And that, that's why, Mike, to your question earlier about like filling out the lineup, there are still a lot of use cases that, that we don't solve for. Um, that we want to. And so we're going to continue to think about how do we solve different people's sleep problems and, and what are the right products to do that within our lineup overall that makes shopping still simple and easy and intuitive, but solves what, whatever it is that you're shopping for today. Going back to that, the, the Van Winkle reference, I believe the premise there was the, the idea was we're going to retain a relationship with this consumer by talking to them about sleep, providing them with content about their sleep kind of like during this period in time where they're just sleeping on a Casper mattress but not actively shopping for a new one or anything. Is that is that a fair assessment of what that was about or what the intent was? And if so, uh, I guess I'm, I'm, I'm assuming that that just proved to be a tall order, uh, maybe just t- tough to make the, the numbers work on that. And is there another way to do that? Like, is there a way perhaps, if not through content, then through technology or data or some of these tracking type uh, relationships, is it, is there some other way to achieve that same end that you're seeing on the horizon? Yeah. So um, I think the way you characterize Van Winkles was right. Uh, it, it was a playful approach with content around sleep. Uh, and, and the idea was just to build frequency with our customers. And so, you know, it, it, it had content you know, wide ranging on various sleep topics. And the idea was, you know, you're not in market to buy a mattress or sleep products every month or week or whatever it is, but maybe you'll, you'll consume some of the content. And so it was a way to build frequency with our customers. And, and there are lots of ways to build frequency with our customers. And we, we think about that. So, you know, even in our advertising, uh, you know, we, we've been well known for some of our subway advertising in New York City. Part of what we said when we approached that creative was, um, you know, not... Not everyone is in market for a mattress at any given time. Let's make the creative enjoyable for people who are not in the market for the mattress every time. So if you read our subway ads, you'll still enjoy the ads, even it's just a way to build frequency and to build uh, more of a relationship with the brand. And so uh, advertising is a, is a way that I think you know retailers and, and brands uh, often o- assume is transactional, but doesn't need to be. Uh, and th- there are lots of ways to do it. You know, you mentioned you know, digital digital ways. You know, apps, the the meditation apps that we talked about, that they do have a relationship around sleep that consumers are consuming daily, weekly, monthly, whatever daily. it may be. Um, so that that is definitely yeah. a way to build frequency and have a relationship beyond um, a transactional one when it comes to sleep. And, and we think that we're in the early days of how consumers are thinking about that. And again, the, the Apple Watch will, will help you track sleep. It'll help you think about sleep. Putting putting your phone in night mode, like. All of these things are touch points that are around sleep that have consumers thinking about sleep more so today than ever before. And we think that's great. And Casper is organically trying to find ways to, to play in, in a number of different areas. In terms of advertising, uh, first of all, one of the things we like to look at, just branded search trends in terms of query volumes by various brands. And it's uh, if you look at that chart, I mean, Casper, I mean, it just blew me away the first time I, I looked that up. 
back in 2015 or 2016, just how quickly Casper came onto the scene and really eclipsed these hundred year old brands that were synonymous with mattresses. It was, it was amazing. Um, so you guys had just a phenomenal amount of success right out of the gates on that front. And so I think that's a credit to, obviously it's a, it's a, it's a credit to marketing in general because the best way to, I think it's a, it's perhaps the best proxy for the overall interest you're generating in the brand through your marketing. So um, kudos, and you guys have obviously maintained that uh, over the, over the last few years as well, even beyond when that initial PR frenzy of those 2015, 2016 years wore off. But um, I guess I'm I'm curious about. How you think about marketing efficiency? I mean, I, I, one thing I think that's, that's unique about Casper relative to some of the other D2C brands is you've used more traditional advertising. You mentioned the Subway ads as an example, which were great, by the way. Um, but the uh, but you've used more traditional advertising, and I feel like in the statistics of marketing efficiency, it looks like maybe your efficiency looks lower on a relative basis, perhaps as a result of that. Like, how do you how do you think about that in the scheme of your uh, approach to advertising? So um, I'm a believer in television as a, a channel of advertising. I think channel vision drives better performance in every other channel of advertising. So. The more you advertise on TV, the more Google search there is. So I think part of what you're saying from a, a, an efficiency standpoint has to do with how you attribute um, purchases and how you think about it. On a blended basis, I, I think we actually spent less on sales and marketing as a percentage of net revenue than Purple did last quarter, um, I think. Um, if not, we're, we're always kind of very close. So I think we are very efficient with advertising. And I think um, brands that want to build uh, reach and, and brands that want to build frequency have to think about advertising across a variety of different channels. And I also think digital channels today are getting really expensive and you're seeing CPMs and Facebook and Google uh, reach, you know, certainly pre pandemic levels. And, and, you know, there's a lot of, of kind of fighting for that, that eyeball or that, you know, impression. And so I think the you know, best advertisers out there are thinking about, how to deploy dollars to grow their business in, in you know, uh, less obvious ways or more of a diversified way. And I think that's something Casper has always been very focused on. It's funny that you say uh, less obvious. And I think what you were saying is that like the traditional media is less obvious where the digital was the obvious, because in the, <laughs> as you know, in the history of this industry, <laughs> It's really been the other way around. I mean, the way people, they, they're like, oh, digital, that's so counterintuitive. We could do digital advertising that targets active shoppers. Wow, I never thought of that. But you're thinking of that as like the baseline of obvious. Of course, you got to try to do that as much as possible. Uh, and then you're looking outside of that to the to the more broad reach media as a, as a less obvious thing, which I think is the right way to think about it. I'm curious on the point of in-market shoppers. I'm, I'm sure you're tracking closely this all the privacy changes, the ATT stuff with iOS and uh, what's likely to follow perhaps with Android, you know, maybe following suit, let's say, and how that impacts advertising vehicles like Facebook, which you just mentioned, and, and then what that in turn does, like if Facebook doesn't have the ability to really help you find in-market shoppers as effectively, like what does that do then in turn to just the overall, uh, your overall ability to target that part of, you know, your advertising mix. And so how does that, what are you thinking about in that regard? And what's your, what's your vision for how this plays out? Yeah. I mean, um, the cookie deprecation and, and more emphasis on, uh, kind of user privacy, I think is a real concern that everyone in the advertising industry and everyone who acquires customers digitally is, is thinking about, um, including the, you know, the biggest platforms out there like Google and, and Facebook and Amazon, et cetera. Uh, and I think that ultimately it's not going to make a huge difference, meaning I think we're going to still be able to effectively deploy dollars through these channels. I think there is going to be tracking, I'll be using different kind of digital points. I think we're, we're focused on other uh, tools of measurement like attribution modeling and, and media mix modeling and just ways to, triangulate on media efficacy uh, differently than just cookies. And I think the platforms are very focused on it and, and have the ability to 
do different things uh, to supplement what we were using cookies and, and other tracking methodologies for. So I think long answer short, I guess, uh, I think we'll, we'll all figure it out. And um, I think there'll be a, a period of kind of change in just how we, we navigate that. But um, overall, I think it, it's not going to change uh, how companies ultimately deploy dollars and see sales come from that. I mean, that being said, you guys are obviously in a very different position as being obviously one of the very largest and most successful uh, disruptor or whatever, just mattress brands in general. Um, and on top of that, uh, having a, a lot of people, big scale to be able to do some of the things you just described. I'm curious if you if you look at this from the standpoint of some of the smaller D2C brands out there. I mean, do you think that this has the potential to even affect the viability of their businesses? Or do you think that the tools that you just described and the, and the workarounds will be equally available to a smaller DTC brand? I think for, for those companies, um, they have been and will continue to be reliant on the platforms. And Facebook and Google and the platforms are very heavily incentivized to help um, smaller companies figure this out in more of a self-service way. And so I would just bet on Facebook figuring out how to make sure local businesses, smaller businesses still spend sufficiently on Facebook and feel good about getting a return on that investment. Um, and mm -hmm. Facebook is, is as focused on that as they possibly could be. And so my faith would just be that Facebook figures it out and they're not going to leave it to, you know, the smaller businesses to try to figure it out. And, and I think that they're both aligned to make sure that everyone can spend as much money on Facebook with the highest amount of, of kind of faith in that spend possible. Yep. So bet on Facebook, yep. basically. It's <laughs> <Don't bet against laughs> probably a pretty safe bet. They've, <laughs> it's been a good bet so far, yeah. for sure. I said, I said don't bet against Facebook is maybe the better way to put it. <laughs> yeah, that's fair. <laughs> well, speaking of people not to bet against, let's talk a little bit about Amazon. I mean, uh, we've talked uh, even on this podcast, if, if um, but we've Jeff and I have talked at, at length about where we what we see as a potential threat from Amazon. I mean, you know as well as anyone, Amazon's had a phenomenal amount of success in this category. The problem we see for Amazon, um, not just as a competitor uh, to to any retailer, but also as a for a brand, you know, someone that you're maybe evaluating how much to lean into in terms of where to put your products. We see Amazon fundamentally as kind of having a, a, a platform that is designed to give companies two ways to win, price and ratings. And then unfortunately in this category, the cheapest mattresses are kind of just structurally advantaged in getting high ratings. Because, you know, you ask them after two weeks, you know, it's showed up. What What is it? It's a mattress. Yeah, that's what I thought it was going to be. And you know, <laughs> it's fine. It's nothing's, you know, it hasn't broken in two weeks. So yeah, five stars. It was cheap. It's, it, it was a mattress. It met all my expectations, five stars. So, you know, as a result, when cheap mattresses get high ratings and you only have two ways to win price and ratings, it really just leaves price. And so we see it as kind of no accident that it's the cheapest mattresses that's do the most volume on Amazon. It's kind of the only way that story could ever play out. And my question is, do you see a way from where you sit for a brand, a real brand like Casper, who's not just selling the cheapest product, who's, who's selling premium products to win on Amazon in the long term. Yeah. So I think the way you characterize it is, is right. Historically was that in the past, the two ways to win were price and ratings. Uh, the part that I, I would, uh, you know, add to that is um, today and kind of going forward, I think there's a third way to win, which is advertising. Um, I, I forgot the exact stat, but it's something like Amazon's ad platform today takes in more ad dollars than Twitter, Pinterest, uh, um, Snapchat, and a couple of others combined. Meaning it is a massive ad platform that competes with Google and, and Facebook now as, as one of the big ad platforms. And Google, I mean, Amazon knows that that's a huge business for them, great margin, very profitable. And so increasingly, they're going to let brands win by paying to be more visible. And that's where higher price points can get more visibility. That's where higher price points can afford to be competitive with, you know, very low cost, high rated beds, but really aren't high quality beds when you end up, you know, 
thinking about them over time. Um, and so I think that is a change in, in Amazon's strategy. They didn't have a big ad platform a few years ago. And I, I think they're increasingly focused on that because it's a, it's a higher margin business for them. Um, and so I, I do think, you know, we, we actually have a great business with Amazon. You know, we're, we're always keeping a cautious eye on it. And, and we've you know, had pricing issues like everyone else before. But overall, we think that they can be a great partner. You can drive real interest on higher price point items that have the ability to compete on a, a broader perspective than just uh, price and value. I mean, sorry. Price and value. It'll be interesting to see. That's a, that's a, it's an interesting point uh, about the advertising and, and the change of mindset there. I mean, it'll be interesting to see how much they allow those advertisers to kind of, I guess, be isolated from some of these other, these, these, these pressures that otherwise exist in this platform, you know, like, the fact that there's these other mattresses right there that also have high ratings that are that are much cheaper. I mean, even on like the I was on a Casper page on Amazon yesterday and I saw like down in the videos section it was just like a bunch of reviews of that supposedly were for Casper, but they were actually reviews of just other cheaper products and a lot of times it was like best mattress under five hundred dollars or whatever. You know, there's just so many elements of the platform that are really just designed to keep pushing people down to those products. So it'll be interesting to see if they somehow allow advertisers to remove themselves from those uh, those features that are otherwise kind of core to the platform. Yeah, it's interesting. Let's talk about the consumer journey. I mean, you have one of the best omni-channel vantage points of any brand, right? Now you're in you got your direct uh, online stuff. You've got your direct O&O stuff. You've got your uh, retail showrooms that you're in, as well as the, the kind of warehouse channel. I mean, you're basically as omnichannel as they come. What are you guys seeing in your data about how the consumer shopping journey is changing? And maybe even like more specifically, what data are you watching most closely to see how it's going to change going forward? Yeah, I, I think the data that we see and, and what we try to talk to customers about uh, to, to understand this more is just the interconnectivity of the channels. And so th there, in our mind, there's no such thing as like an e-com customer and, you know, owned and operated retail store customer and a retail partner customer that increasingly, especially as we get more and more distribution, customers are shopping all of these channels, oftentimes you know, either concurrently or within very short order of each other. And so that, that's where, you know, we think about consistency and, and giving people different things across different channels because they're in different states of mind, meaning digital a lot of times is more of a, a an education process. It's exploratory. What are the brands I want to shop? Um, you know, retail partners, a lot of times it's convenience. It's, you know, I'm going to be at the mall on Saturday, so I'm going to stop by Lululemon and the Apple Store in Casper to pick up, you know, what I need for, for the house. Um, you know, COVID has changed consumer behavior too, and we see you know fewer destinations really trying to to aggregate your shopping across fewer touch points, and and we'll see what that you know does over time. But it's really about this interconnectivity about how consumers are going to shop because it's a high consideration purchase. Um, so I think different retailers have different different consumer journeys, but ours is is one where we think you know consumers are spending time to shop to learn. And then ultimately transact where it's most convenient. And, and you kind of have to win on each of those. You have to win on the education phase. You have to win on, on kind of the quality and, and really, you know, being the best. And then you have to win on, on offering a convenient, um, you know, delivery and shopping experience. Are you able to track individual consumers across those different touch points? Or is it just kind of looking at each touch point and sort of saying, are we able to win at this touch point? And then kind of separately, are we able to win at this other touch point? You know, it, it's, it's tough, especially on the retail partnership side. You know, we have better visibility about how consumers connect between our stores and, and our dot com. Um, it's mm -hmm. tough to get a full picture. And then, you know, there, there are digital areas where people shop, too, that we don't own or control. And so, you know, it, it's not a perfect picture. That's why we talk to customers. We use anecdotal feedback. We, we do customer insight work and customer surveys. Um, we, we use data where we can. Uh, and then we ultimately just try to use insights and, and kind of go with our interpretation of, you know, partial data, partial anecdotal, and try to draw the right conclusion on how to improve the customer experience. Mm hmm. What are you, um, speaking of, of data and what you're seeing, the, uh, 
outlook and so forth. We've seen obviously like kind of a, a an explosion in demand in this category. You know, there's kind of really just in my mind mathematically two explanations for it. It's either like the demand got pulled forward and you have cohorts that are replacing their mattress that otherwise might have waited till next year to do it. Um, or you have some kind of externality that's like new household creation that's that's kind of coming in and and creating this added demand. I mean, what do you see as the what what explains the increase in demand and how that translates into what the outlook looks like for the home furnishings category overall in these next 12 to 24 months? Yeah, we, so we see a, a strong consumer backdrop and a strong macro environment. And, and I think there's a, a few things. Um, one, you know, household formations and, and people moving uh, did increase. And I think we'll stay strong because we are in a scarce supply environment. So a lot of people are waiting to move. But low interest rates means that people can buy and people are moving. And there are people who you know wanted to move to the suburbs because of what happened. There are people who now want to move back to urban centers because of what happened. And so I, I just think moving is going to be elevated um, for some time now. And, and I think housing will be strong because of the macro environment. I also think COVID put wellness more front and center to people. And I think sleep is increasingly a part of, of wellness for people. Like the, the top of every doctor's list on how to survive if God forbid you got COVID was sleep a lot, rest and, and you know feel, be feel your best. And it's the same for having a strong immunity system. And so I think people are realizing that getting a great night of sleep is important. People are spending more time at home in their bedrooms, working from their bedrooms and just um, even as travel comes back, I think people are going to appreciate that sleep is really important. And that's, that's the, the wellness of COVID. It's, you know, things like we've talked about the aura ring, the whoop, et cetera. So I just think sleep is more front of mind than it's ever been. And that's going to be good for share wallet. And then, um, overall, I, I just think that people are hearing more and more about new sleep innovation and, and it's going to drive good replacement cycles. And so I think, um, you know, there wasn't a lot of innovation for years. And then over the last several years, you know, Casper and others have come along and talked about the latest and greatest and really new sleep technology um, in ways that I think are driving people to replace beds sooner than later. And and um, I, I also think there were a lot of really inexpensive beds bought that require replacement sooner than later. And so I think all of this is, is good to see, you know, unit and dollar volume increase for the industry for what I believe will be years to come. It's a good rosy picture there. What about like speaking of, of years to come, what do you as you look forward to the future of this industry? Let's talk about like five to 10 years from now. I mean, what do you think this industry looks like, whether in terms of kind of product innovation and technology or the consumer journey, how that is going to look or competitive landscape is another thing. I mean, it's been obviously a uh, pretty uh, blood blood infested waters for a long time now. What what do you think this industry looks like in five to ten years? Yeah, so I, I think you're already seeing kind of a, a normalization period for the industry, which you know if you think about kind of um, normal disruption phases or normal innovation cycles, we went through kind of the phase of of uh, a lot of change, a lot of disruption, a, a lot of options for consumers. We're now seeing the number of options decrease. Um, whether that's companies just fading away or consolidation or whatever it may be. I, so I think you're seeing a normalization from consumer options, which also helps normalize customer acquisition costs and, and what people are spending on marketing, et cetera. So I think you're seeing healthier and healthier kind of business models and, and P&Ls around that. And then I, I think that consolidation kind of continues in, in that there's just going to be fewer brands that are relevant to consumers. So, I don't think consumers will, will be as reliant on the beds on the floor of their mattress store near them as they were today or five years ago. I think consumers don't, won't feel the need to shop a dozen different beds or brands. And I think there'll be a handful of brands that are trusted by consumers, that are sought after, that have good brand awareness. And those handful of brands will, will take the majority of market share. Um, and the winners will be ones that are investing in uh, true omni-channel capabilities, giving consumers what they want in the medium they want, when they want it, uh, and have the, the ability to invest in, in innovation to keep up with consumers who are only getting you know pickier and pickier by the minute. And the brands that can deliver on that, and the retailers that can deliver on that, 
Uh, great, they're, they're going to continue to do well. And the, the brands that can't and the retailers that can't are going to struggle and lose share. So you see this market becoming more consolidated, less fragmented over that time period. While we're thinking about forward-looking thinking stuff, I actually had a question I was going to ask you. I mean, <laughs> review sites, you were obviously one of the first people to see the challenges with review sites. I mean, you had some lawsuits a few years ago even related to that. I'm curious, what is your view of like the future of these review sites in this category? You know, I, I think unfortunately for consumers, there are still good and bad actors in the review site landscape. And, and I use the term review site loosely. I think a lot of them are affiliates who are purely play, uh, pay to play. Uh, my hope is that that also gets more transparent, more consolidated, uh, and that consumers increasingly know what they're reading and where it's coming from and why that source is saying what they're saying. And so I think there are trusted sources out there like Consumer Reports and others. Uh, and I think there are a lot of uh, sources out there that aren't, it shouldn't be trusted. And my hope is just that there's increased uh, transparency and scrutiny around that and that we get to a place where you know, objective information is, is out there and people who are offering bona fide reviews uh, do really well and become more visible in the, the places who aren't, um, you know, don't, don't persist. Another issue that Jeff and I have talked about is, is just kind of like a raising, raising a, a, a flag of concern for the industry is returns and just the, the fact that a lot of returns are, are ending up in landfills these days. The donation ecosystem is pretty saturated. Obviously, returns were so critical, and having a generous return policy has been critical to really enabling uh, Casper and the entire online mattress ecosystem to get to where it is today. But I'm curious, now that you look at it from where you are now with this fully omni-channel approach, you obviously have... Um, a lot of costs that you're having to absorb as it relates to returns, sometimes which come from people kind of indiscriminately abusing a return policy. And I'm curious, we've talked about the idea of like maybe the fact that the consumers don't have a lot of skin in the game in current return policies plays into the fact that this this ultimately is is maybe returns are a bigger part of the cost structure for, for that other consumers ultimately have to pay and a bigger tax on our environment than it needs to be. I'm curious, like now that you're in this position uh, today, wh what's your view on that? Like, do you see that there's a better path forward for return policies than maybe where we've been or, or what do you think? So, I mean, we thought we start with kind of what do we optimize for and we try to put the customer at the center of everything we do and the customer the priority in in our framework of priorities and so um, what we start at with is the idea that whether you buy a mattress site unseen or you tried it in a store the ability to return it without losing money without being out of pocket or without having you know a lot of friction in that return is, is fair, like to, to us, that's the right way to buy a mattress. Sleep on it for a while. If after a break-in period, you don't feel like it's the right mattress for you, you shouldn't be out of pocket. You shouldn't have to go break your back to return the product. And so we, we think that's the right thing from a customer journey side of it. Um, there are of course other priorities that you mentioned like uh, the environmental impact and what the return process is like and the financial impact. And you know, over time, there's always abuse in any system, but we, we feel like uh, there, there's less people abusing it. There, there's just less people shouting about, you know, take advantage of our return policy, unlimited returns, things like that. So we think the industry is rationalized. We think competition is, is kind of thinking about things um, in, in a fair, you know, orderly situation. I think there's definitely room to, to for the industry to improve its environmental impact. And we're doing a lot around ESG initiatives to think about that and ultimately act on that. Um, and so there are a number of considerations, but again, our, our guiding principle has to do with what's the right thing for the consumer, and then we'll work backwards to, to try to optimize everything else. Fair enough. All right. Well, then last question, unless you have anything, Jeff, I just want to ask, um, Philip, is there anything I didn't ask you that you think is important? Always a dangerous question. Um, <laughs> I feel like we covered a lot of ground, so... Uh... <laughs> 
we did warn you that it was going to be a nerdy podcast. That's, I mean, that's okay. <laughs> what I listen to, so all good. <laughs> All right. Well, great. Well, this has been awesome. We really appreciate you being on the show. Thank you so much. And it was a lot of fun having uh, going through all this. And thanks so much for just being so open with everything. And uh, I'm sure this is going to be super in insightful for all the people listening to it. Thank you for having me, guys. It was fun. Uh, I really appreciate it. And uh, I'm happy you guys are doing this podcast and uh, uh, happy I could join. Awesome. Well, hey, for uh, those of you listening out there, if you like what you're hearing, please uh, subscribe to the show and hey, leave us a review in the uh, uh, Apple podcast uh, app. It helps other people discover the podcast. In the meantime, thanks for listening. Thanks to our guest, Philip Krim, for joining us. And we're out. <laughs>